Hello and welcome to uh, Tibetan Buddhist art and visual culture. Um, here we are, it's, we're plowing along, it's June 2021, it's June 7th today, and it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, our class to our guest lecturer today, Wenxing Zhou. She is an associate professor of East Asian art at Hunter College at the City, of, City University of New York, the CUNY system. Um, her research focuses on the relationship between religious vision and early modern empiricism in the art of China and the Himalayas, as well as the intersection of history, geography, and biography in Buddhist traditions. Her first book, which is here on my shelf, I can, I'll hold it up actually at the end, uh, is Mount Wutai, Visions of a Sacred Buddhist Mountain, and was published in 2018, and it's a beautiful volume. So um, for any of you who are getting more interested in the topics that we're discussing here, I very much endorse that you pick it up. Um, and her current research project explores the courtly culture of linguistic and material pluralism in Qing, China. So thanks so much, Wenxing, for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Richardson, for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so Wenxing, you are going to speak to us a little bit today about um, your research on the Bodhisattva emperors of the Manchu Qing dynasty. And our students have read your chapter that was published as part of the uh, Faith and Empire catalog. Art and Politics in Tibetan Buddhism. So they are as prepared for the topic as that permits. And this is part of our course on Tibetan art. So we're really looking forward to this. So take it away. Oh, do I need to make you co-host again? Or did um, I? I think I did. You may, you may not. I think I can do, uh -huh. I can go. Yeah. Great. So okay. um, I'll share my screen. So hello again, everyone. Um, thank you so much to Professor Sarah Richardson for this opportunity for me to be here and to be with all of you and to share my research. And I, I'm hoping to have very, you know, something more of a, a conversation with you um, because I'm also in doing my research, also try, always trying to learn from students like like you what questions you have um, and what you can also bring to the, the conversation. So, so the topic that I'm here to discuss, um, the sort of broad topic is you know, for this week for, uh, is from the assigned reading is, is Tibetan Buddhist art in the imperial court of the Manchu Qing Empire uh, in 18th century Beijing. So um, as you probably have gathered from previous week or two, this topic of Tibetan Buddhist art in the context of courtly rule in China is a very interesting and often controversial chapter in the history of Tibetan Buddhist art. So I think interesting because they're some of the most lavish and elaborate art made at courts in which the, the majority of the state's subjects, right, the people they're ruling, did not necessarily have access to nor much less subscribe to the practice of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and, and they have also, I think, controversial because they have also been very different views of what was happening and why. So for example, the questions of whether the Yuan, Ming, and Qing emperors were, say, primarily motivated by spiritual gain or by political gain, control uh, of their sort of inner Asian subjects uh, in their patronage of Tibetan Buddhism, and by extension, whether their art should be read as political propaganda or a testament to their, their religious devotion. Are, these are kind of age old topic that um, people still like to debate over. And that is one of the reasons for Carl Debrezeni, who I just heard, learned was here this last week, um, the reason for, for his volume, his exhibit in volume, Faith and Empire. So for my part, as a scholar of both Tibetan Buddhist art and a historian of Qing China, I find these kind of controversies, if you like to call them, very, also very interesting because I think they reflect a, a kind of a, an interesting gulf, a, a gulf that always actually exists, but in this case, quite pronounced between, on the one hand, sort of our modern post-enlightenment, post-colonial understanding of what is politics, religion, or spirituality, um, you know, what they are or what they should be. And uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, 
the, the particular ways in which people in the Qing era who engaged in making, in the making and exchange of Tibetan religious art objects. Uh, so these are people who may be emperors, uh, monks, artisans, and how, you know, how this gulf between our ideas of these categories and, and how they operated. Um, so I've therefore been interested in my work in general in understanding why works of art were made and why they were seen, what different roles they play, and, um, and how they can be a kind of helpful lens through which to unpack the history of Qing inner Asian relations more on their own terms than on our terms. So to that end, one of the things that I, I try to highlight, and you can tell me if I succeeded because you're the readers, um, in my essay in the Faith and Empire volume that you read this week, uh, what I try to highlight is a more fluid sense of time and a kind of dynamic relationship to the past than what we might be familiar with today. This, this temporality, as well as the sense of identity that comes with it, are key to understanding how the Manchu Qing emperors and Tibetan clerics saw themselves and how they related to one another. And uh, this, they are informed, this, this, this sense of time, identity, are informed as much by the Tibetan Buddhist notions of reincarnation as they are by a broader trend, trend in geneal genealogical thinking, in, this interesting genealogy um, in 18th century Qing court. So my presentation today takes a closer look at one particular work in the essay that you read, uh, and I have it on the screen, so you have been able to kind of take it in uh, while I'm talking. Um, and I'm going to focus on this one work uh, to uh, expand on what it might have meant to uh, reimagine the past through the activities of gift, gift, gift exchange and through acts of copying. Uh, feel free to stop me at any point for clarification. I, I, I'm just talking, I'm, you know, I don't hear anybody. So if you interrupt me, I'd actually be really grateful to know that someone is listening. So don't be shy. Um, if you just couldn't catch a word that I'm saying, or you're just stuck on something, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, uh, I'll mute yourself and, and just ask me directly. Of course, if you have bigger questions, please save them until the end where hopefully we'll still have plenty of uh, time for discussion. Um, so, uh, so this Tanka painting, which was made in the Qing Imperial Workshop uh, around the year, a little prior to the year 1780, portrays the 17th, uh, the, sorry, portrays the sixth century Indian philosopher Pavivaka through a variety of idioms and techniques to both designate his spiritual prowess and intellectual refinement. So, uh, Paviveka here uh, is shown wearing um, a Tibetan monk's scholar's hat and robes and carries with him a round basket of traveling possessions to denote his status as a renunciate. Uh, well, his facial features, um, so he, it's quite, quite pronounced facial features, the bulging eyeballs, the up, thick, thick upturned brows, and the subtly shaded beards and chests all point to this kind of uh, imagination of the kind of otherly Indic identity. Um, he is uh, shown, he, his hand gestures here are, uh, shows him as, uh, hand gestures show him as engaging in an animated debate in the Tibetan tradition. On the right here, he's kind of a diminutive opponent, uh, a heretic with greenish color skin and dreadlocks, uh, uh, who eventually takes Tanser uh, subsequent to his defeat in the, oh, can you, let's see. Oh, sorry, I am, let's see. I need to get back to my screen here. Okay, here. So there's, you know, he was up here and then he goes down to the bottom here, takes Tanser um, as he um, uh, subsequently is being subjugated, defeated by, by Pav Veka. Um, and uh, the, the philosopher sits in front of a painted screen here. 
and this is just a, a very detail of that section. Um, and you can see here the sort of mountain landscape that's painted on that screen, which is a favorite device, a pictorial device in, in, the, in the traditional Chinese scholars portraiture um, for exhibiting the sort of inner landscape of the subject. The screen's subtle ink monochrome landscape. So it's, you know, just basically you see the green background, but it's supposed to be an ink monochrome landscape, which is evocative of the lofty monumental landscape paintings of eighth century Chinese poets and artists Wang Wei appears here as a kind of ethereal analog to the highly stylized blue and green landscape that opens into the distance to uh, on the right hand side. The string bound books and scrolls you can see here at the center of the composition, as well as this kind of tiled lattice garden studio complete with peonies and a scholar's rock in the foreground are further indexical of classical Chinese erudition. So uh, the a question that arises is, you know, why was this sixth century uh, Indian Buddhist patriarch appearing in the attires of a Tibetan monk scholar and within the garden studio and inner mindscapes of a Chinese gentleman? What about him was of interest for and relevance to the 18th century Manchu Qing court? As we shall see, the image's compression between this sixth century India and 18th century China results from a long standing visual exchange between the Qing court and Tibet. The tanka was one in a series of tankas that were created as wall, paint, wall hangings to decorate a new monastery that was built at the Qing imperial summer retreat of Chengde or Rehe, northeast of Beijing, to house the visiting six Pension Lama. Here I have a, well, I have, again, I have this problem with um, right hand click, let me see. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, yes. Does somebody want to say something? Yes. Oh no, that was just me. We're good. Okay. <laughs> did you? Yeah. Did you? Were you able to see? I somehow yeah. it jumps out because of my hyperlink, and I have just. Oh, taken, okay. Yeah. I wanted Sorry. to. I have that if, if we need to look at details, but it's, uh, it's funny. So, um, so here's a, a painting made in the Tin Court of the the figure of the six pension we're talking about that I'm putting up here just to give you a sense of who the the special guest is who, for which this tanka was made. Um, and so the sixth pension um, was um, at the time of his travel to the Qing court, the most eminent and powerful Tibetan Buddhist cleric in Tibet. Uh, and so his visit was the, an ultimate gesture of alliance and mutual recognition. Um, at, at this point, I think it's useful to point out that the Qing empire reached the height of its territorial expansion under the reign of the Qianlong emperor shown here in the 18th century. So while Qianlong and his predecessors, mostly we're looking at his father and grandfather, uh, while they achieved um, this sort of uh, territorial imperial expansion through what has been characterized by uh, the historian Joanna Wiley Cohen as a culture of war, meaning they both actively fought military campaigns and they also prided themselves on that culture, on, that, on their military achievement. Um, so even though that's sort of the case for their expansions everywhere else, uh, when it came to central Tibet, um, Qianlong, uh, especially, he opted instead for diplomacy and indirect rule by supporting, managing, and to some extent, becoming a part of the Gelukpa church of the Dalai Lama and the Pension Lamas through the kind of embodiment of the Tibetan ideal of divine kingship. So uh, the, the fifth 
so if going back all the way to the time of the fifth Dalai Lama, jointly with the fourth Pension Lama in the 17th century, they first already recognized the Manchu emperors as emanations of Manjushri, uh, which is a deity as traditionally associated with China. Uh, and, and this was done, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Dalai Lamas, who were considered to be earthly emanations of another great being, Avalokiteshvara, um, the Bodhisattva of Compassion who was seen in, as a protector of Tibet uh, and also venerated by the Mongols. So this portrait on the left here uh, 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 of, of, of the Tianlong Emperor, you can see the same face, right? The, one, the same face is the one that's here, a little slightly older, uh, was uh, painted by uh, the Jesuit court artist uh, Giuseppe Castiglione. Um, and you know, the, he only painted it so you could see, you could recognize that face, whereas all the rest of the paintings were done by court uh, artist of Tibetan tradition. And um, so what this painting shows, and I'm just showing you a small portion of it, is um, uh, presents, what it presents is uh, Tianlong, uh, this kind of, uh, the, the guise of a kind of wheel turning Manjushri, a Bodhisattva um, in the center of this much, much larger Tanka. So the idea of emperor as Bodhisattva that I'm sure you've all read about. Um, uh, at the same, and so I think this this is a kind of image that really expresses that identity without reservation. Uh, at the same time, the Manchu emperors also took up the model of a of a what you'll often read about as priest patron or preceptor elms giver relationship, the Cheyong tradition, that had been the basis of the Mongol Tibetan alliance as the. Uh, um, uh, by, uh, and so they have also taken up uh, this, this Choyong, Choyong or preceptor elms giver relationship by establishing relations with Tibetan clerics. Um, so in this model, the benefactor uh, in the position of a political leader is understood to offer material support and military protection to a hierarch in return for religious instruction and spiritual protection. Uh, so this detail on the right here, dating to a much earlier time, um, a, a mural painting from the Potala Palace captures this mutual dependence between the Qing Emperor, which who you see here on the right. By the way, can you see my cursor if I need to use it? Yes, I can see okay, your cursor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so and then the uh, fifth Dalai Lama on the left here. Um, so, uh, um, the the Qing Emperor, the Dalai Lama, who ruled Central Tibet, right? So the the Qing Manchus, um, the emperors, by adopting the role of a supreme benefactor of the Gelugpa school, this superseded uh, others, like especially most prominently the Dzungar Mongol patronage of Tibet, and was where they and that's how they were able to extend their control over both Mongolia and Tibet. Uh, so in, in light of this kind of uh, background of understanding, uh, the sixth pension's visit to the Tianlong Emperor is both to greet uh, a royal bodhisattva incarnate and also to give religious teachings and uh, to the sort of imperial alms giver. The pension and his entourage had traveled from his home monastery in central Tibet, uh, the home monastery of Trashilumpo, um, across uh, the Eurasia to, uh, to come to the Qing court, um, kind of overland from Mongolia to Beijing. So I want to take just a brief moment here to highlight the fact that this travel was, was a huge deal, not only because of how far and arduous this uh, it took this about six months, this travel was, but um, traditionally Tibetan clerics who received invitation to visit cap the capital in China, they were very hesitant to go uh, primarily because of the great risk of contracting smallpox uh, if they were to leave their the Tibetan Highland um, 
to go into kind of inner China because most Tibetans don't have, didn't already have immunity against smallpox. So I recently learned from a, a talk by Lobsang Yongden uh, that the Sixth Pension had in fact insisted on inoculating all the members of his entourage before they arrived in the Beijing. It is a big deal uh, against the advice. And this was, he did it so without, against the advice of the Qing officials who were welcoming them uh, because uh, for a simple reason, because the Qing practice at the time was only to inoculate children, not grownups. Uh, as you, I think maybe we all now are very versed in this language, but inoculation is very different from our vaccines today in that it's the process of introducing a small amount of live virus into the body through kind of, I think what they did was rubbing kind of scabs directly into the skin of an unexpected, uh, the scabs of virus in, directly into the skin of an uninfected person. So, so that process was enormously risky. I mean, we, we talk about vaccine hesitancy today, but that was something that was really quite dangerous and scary and had to really be managed, this kind of process of inoculation. Uh, and also it, it was difficult to carry out because it required a lot of quarantining of any individual that was going through this process. So the pension evidently, evidently took great pains to ensure the safety of all of those who traveled with him, but he failed to inoculate himself. Um, perhaps under the mistaken belief that he had already been exposed to the virus before uh, through what he thought was surface contamination. Again, very interesting for, uh, to think about today uh, through a gift that he had received. But because this was not the case, uh, about a month into his stay in Beijing, he caught smallpox and died. I think that by now in, in our global pandem pandemic, we can all better appreciate the kind of the fragility and uncertainty of life, regardless of the amount of precautions we take. Um, and so this, this case, this a case in the 18th century was a kind of extremely high profile case of it. Um, and the ramifications of which we will come back to uh, at the end of, of this, this segment of my talk. But returning to this kind of careful planning of the pensions visit, it took, uh, uh, you know, for us, it, the process began as long as soon as um, the visit was planned, which is uh, about a year and a half before the pension llama actually arrived. Oh, I see a hand. Sorry, Wenxing. Okay, Michelle yes. has a question. Yes. Thank yeah, you. Um, sorry, just to clarify. Yes. So the pension, did he um, die before getting to Beijing? No, sorry. So he he died a month after getting oh, a month after a month into his stay in Beijing. So it took him about six months to get to the capital area. Another month or so before he actually made it into Beijing because he was in uh, the summer palace area in Chengde. Um, so about seven. I have to get the exact dates to you, but um, if you're interested, but about seven, eighth month uh, into the whole travel, but about a month after he had arrived arrived in the capital. So we know he contracted smallpox in Beijing. Got it. Yeah. So, um, um, so yeah, so this was, uh, and, and so I think, you know, it's kind of, you, you, you think about this trip that took almost two years to plan uh, and the kind of precautions everyone on both ends took um, and um, the great deal of fanfare that was involved as well. And this included uh, not least of which was uh, at least two new monasteries that were built, one in Chengde, which we'll get to in a second. It's just basically Northeast of Beijing. And another one in the Imperial Summer Palace, uh, which is now in the Xiangshan area, if you, any of you know Beijing. Uh, which is uh, which was at the time directly outside of the capital. Um, so, oh, uh, this is very weird. Okay, let me see. Okay, so, so this is the a view of the new monastery in Chengde that was designed as an architectural copy of the Pension's home monastery of Tashi Lumpo. Of, of course, it actually looks nothing like it, but it's the idea that, you know, we're building an exact replica of your home here to welcome you here. Um, and the entire mon monastic complex was outfitted with objects and imageries to welcome the Pension. 
Um, and it was in the most private quarter of the monastery, and you can see the highlight here, um, which is the pensions guest house. So the, the rest of it are like various different uh, halls, various ceremonies, prayer halls, and other, and this, this you know, multi-story building here was where the pension actually stayed. And this is the guest house where the painting was, was hung. And it was hung alongside 13 other, oh, actually 12 other tankas in the same series of, of 13 tankas total. And each of them depict a previous incarnation of the sixth pension lama in a lineage that ends with the sixth pension himself. Um, so again, just a, a brief uh, recap of what that means. So as you probably have this has been drilled home to you by now in this class, this idea of rebirth, right? It's, it's, a really, it's really a fact across different, all different Buddhist traditions. Uh, individuals are understood to wander through this kind of endless cycle of existences, existences, existence. And the ultimate goal of Buddhism, again, across all traditions is to seek release from this condition, this condition of samsaric existence. And in Tibet in particular, the idea of rebirth gained an important application toward the preservation of authority from around the 13th century onward. Spiritual and worldly rulers were seen as manifestations of liberated beings and reincarnations of saintly individuals who chose to return, return for the benefit of others. So from about the 16th century um, onward, it became increasingly popular to provide accounts and representations of previous incarnations uh, of very eminent Tibetan lamas that extended to distant past in Buddhist India. So this kind of process of retracing become more complicated and goes back further to India. Uh, beginning in around the 17th century, paintings of incarnation lineages uh, became a visual and material expression for this concept of this uh, beneficial rebirth. Um, so, and this is where we find the sixth century Indian philosopher Paviveka being traced to as an earlier life of the Pension Lama. So this is the complete lineage here up to the sixth Pension Lama, who is the one who uh, is, is about to travel, is arriving at the Qing court, uh, the sixth Pension Lama Pelden Yeshe. Um, so if you look at this uh, by this time, a very established lineage of incarnations. It, it, it in fact begins uh, the, the, four, the first four in the lineage, Suputi, King Yashas, Bhaviveka, Abhaya, uh, uh, Karagupta, they're both, they're all kind of, they all have Indic origins. So Bhuti was actually a disciple of the Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, King Yashas is more of a kind of like a, could be Indian, could be myth, semi-mythical figure. The three and the four are both kind of, Viveka was an important philosopher of the middle way. Abhaya Gupta Kara, uh, Karagupta was a kind of tantric master, also philosopher. And so we've got these four Indian figures before they, the lineage become traced to um, um, Tibetan figures, beginning with Golatsawa Kukpa uh, Lhatse, and then uh, Sakya Pandita, uh, Yuntun Dorje, and so on, until they eventually get traced to people who were formerly recognized as the Pension Lamas. And even then, you know, the first uh, three did not they didn't know in their lifetime that they were uh, pension lamas. They were retroactively traced to as previous incarnations that were, so they, they weren't actually given the title, but they were sort of retro, um, what is it called? Um, uh, post posthumously given the title of the first, second, third pension lamas. Um, so, um, uh, and, and so that's the, that that gives you a sense of what this what this lineage looks like and and these are the 13 tankas that uh, the subject matter of the 13 tankas that were that were hung in the guest house so I, I I don't have we don't have all 13 or maybe we will at some point but two of them made their way to the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, and we know 
I think I know fairly certainly from various ways of deducing that these were the very tankas that were hung in the in the, in the guest house. Uh, so here, I think the choice of art is as a form of hospitality is 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 clear. It's to welcome the pension as he entered what was a new replica of his home monastery on his arrival at the Qing court, um, and and it's actually what it displays is a fresh new panorama of the pension's current and past life. Uh, so on the left here again is this kind of famed Indian scholar transported into the elegant mountain retreat of a Chinese literati, and the, on the right as the eminent Kidrup J, who was a chief disciple of the founder of the Gelugpa school, Tsongkhapa, who is seen here under this very elegant plum blossom and this blue-green outcrop, uh, outcroppings on the other side. Um, I, th I think here, as we think about this, what it means for, for this to be displayed, where it was and how it was, the choice was uh, both intimate and bold. Intimate because it gestures on the part of the Qing imperial workshops and the Qing court and the Qing emperor, knowledge and affirmation uh, of the basis of the pension's lineage and authority, right? So this is the this is his, this is his rebirth lineage um, that they know well. It's also bold because the paintings were in fact very unique Qing adaptations of iconic imageries that were produced at the pension's own court that the pension had sent as gifts to the Qing court. Please feel free, as like you did before, interrupting me anytime because I'm, we're trying to. I'm trying to show this kind of process of exchange, and it kind of gets. I, I get confused sometimes, so just feel free to stop me any any time. So, um, in particular, a um, a set of twelve tankas of the pension's rebirth lineage was sent by the pensions court to the Qianlong's court in the year 1770 for Qianlong's 60th, 60th birthday. Uh, show on the screen here are, are 10 of which, uh, which are still in the collection of the Palace Museum in Beijing. Um, and they were presumably the models for the repeated Qing copies. Um, so, you know, we have this the, our painting on the very left, far left, and then you have also an album copy in the middle, and then you have multiple gold filled or non gold filled ink engravings. Um, and, and they're not made of just like one of the, you know, every time they make these, it's of the entire uh, lineage plus one. Uh, why plus one? Does anybody have any idea why it's not 12, but 13 that they're making? Any guesses? Michelle's hand is up there. I don't have a guess, but I have a question. Okay, you can ask your question. Um, so why would the pension gift uh, someone mm -hmm. tankas of himself and not them to some like mm. for their birthday? Yeah, that's a really good question. It, would you, uh, you know, as a, you mean, I, I, I really like, the, this is kind of exact kind of questions that I, I think about, right? So what's the equivalent, right? I mean, you're thinking for, you know, if, if you're trying to honor someone else, why do you, you know, why would you be giving things of, you know, uh, about you? Um, and I, I'll ask you to hold off on that and we can maybe come back to it at the end, uh, because I think it actually in, fa it in fact has to do, there's a lot of different ways to answer this question, but the very hmm, um, understanding of who is oh, of you and I, <laughs> the difference between you and I and the relationship between you and I is something that's quite interesting. It's at play here. Um, but um, this was a known standard practice. So the Dalai Lama also sent multiple uh, uh, sets of his lineage paintings. Uh, very importantly, and this relates to the question that I had for you as of 12 versus 13, is that when the pension sent his, uh, and I'll just give you the answer, the, when the pension gave his, um, lineage paintings to the Qing court, it didn't include himself. So it was not, it was not like, oh, here I am giving you a portrait of myself for your birthday, haha. But here is all of my previous 
all of my predecessors, all of my previous incarnations. Uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, he doesn't make, he, he himself doesn't make it into this kind of established, very iconic uh, and very uh, sort of a venerable set. Yeah, it's basically from the beginning to the, his uh, previous incarnation. And the, 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 pen, the Qing court takes it and make very, very many different copies. Uh, and in all of them, they made sure to include, to honor the sixth pension in the center of this uh, set of, 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 um, of paintings or, or, or other, other media, okay? So that's, well, I'll leave it there and we can come back later. Um, so, um, Wenxing, sorry, there's one, there's two things in the chat too. So Shannon okay. just said or contributed. I can't really see chat. Uh, yeah, but it's okay. I would like it's to. okay. I'll read it to you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So first, before you had kind of answered that, Sam, uh -huh. our friend Sam had guessed that the set included the current Panchen, but so you're saying it did not, right? Yeah. So, yeah. well, actually, that was the answer. That was the thirteenth. Right. So the thirteenth oh, okay. was the current. So, so the set that was sent by. I hope I'm not making this more confusing than it has to be. But uh, the set that uh, the pension has sent as a sixtieth birthday present to the Qing court to Qianlong had only twelve tankas. Okay. Because in, and when the sets that the Qing copied, they added the thirteenth uh, one, which included the, their very honored guests. Of the right, 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 mm -hmm. and then Shannon. Okay, so the, so the Qing court reproduces that set or copies it and adds one. They add one in honor of the guy of the sixth Panchen Lama, and then Shannon also asks or notes. It's interesting that Buddhism focuses on letting go of the self or ego, yet these personalized portraits are so widespread. Oh, we can't hear you now. I think your mic has dropped. I don't know what's going on. Your sound is out. Are other people hearing Wenxing anymore? No, we've lost your sound, Wenxing. Sorry. No. We've lost your sound. Sorry, we can't hear you. Oh. No, I can't hear you. I don't know what happened. Maybe just wiggle the like connection. I don't know. Or in Zoom. No, it's not coming back. Sorry. Um, I don't know what happened. It just dropped. The sound dropped. Mm. Um. Oh, now I heard something. Sorry. I'm here. Let me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know. No. Yeah. Yeah. But very loud. Yeah. This is. How, <laughs> That's how, better. That's okay. better. Yeah. Just, I'm sorry. The connection just dropped. No. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Um, and they. So then Michelle also said, did it take six months to get there too? Yeah, so it took six months, not just because it takes how long it's how long it takes, but it, at every place they stop and then they meet with people and they take rests and they get, you know, they meet. So it's both like, uh, you know, they're giving teachings and then there's also bureaucratic matters like you're meeting officials locally. So it took six months. Uh, it, it normally, that's how long it normally took it at that time, but it, it included a lot of resting time as well. Yeah. Right. And, and also the, it wasn't a direct route, right? So they were mapping things out and they stopped. Uh, uh, the sixth pension, in fact, stayed for a, 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 lar a long period of time in what is now Inner Mongolia area, meeting with important, you know, other uh, uh, giving teachings and other kind of religious figures and also lay officials. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what I, what I, um, do, 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 do. there's a lot of no. What is the no? Sorry, that was about whether we could hear you or oh, okay. not. I asked them and they couldn't. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you. I, I hear I can hear everything's fine, so that's good. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, going back to Shannon's question too. Uh, again, I. I I don't want it to be a cop out, but I would like for us to to not think to drop any your any conception of what Buddhism is for the moment and then we'll come back and I promise we'll come back to address it and also any what is your conception of the self and I'm going to you know do this terrible things that professors do is kind of like 
ask the question back to you, right? So what is what is the conception of the self? And what is personal? What is being personalized? Are these portraits very personalized? Are they even portraits? Um, so I'm, you know, I'm being terrible by, by doing that rather than giving a straight answer. But I think would like, but I think those are the kind of very uh, important question we have to ask ourselves first uh, before we, and then also maybe we can ask ourselves or we can ask of the of the images themselves like how how personalized are they in what sense are they biographical in what sense are they historical in what sense are they portraying what of the people are they portraying uh, um, and, and who are these people anyway and how do they relate to the six pension okay you know if you want to um, you know if you still you can uh, uh, so they have different faces, okay? I don't know. It's interesting, right? Do they have different faces? <laughs> do our, or do they or all the Indians look like Indian faces, right? All the Tibetans look, or you know. So, so what differences there are? That's another really, really great question. I think it gets right at this kind of thing that I'm very interested in, which is like how do we how do we see things in their own terms, and and in that process also trying to work through our assumptions which we always have, you have it, I have it, uh, of, of what is individual, what is the notion of individual, individual self. So I had to do all of this because I couldn't communicate with you or press any buttons while I was screen sharing, but I'm now going to go back to screen sharing and then I can't see you and, or do anything. Okay, so screen share. Uh, Okay. Can you all see the screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, thank you for working through this. This. Um, process or trying to sort of imagine this process of the pension having sent a set 10 years earlier to the Qing court as a gift. You know, it's a great question why that is. Uh, one thing I do want to add to that is that he also sent a lot of other presents. So it's not like it happened out of nowhere he sends. There is a, you know, I'm highlighting this here because I'm trying to show how this Tanka on the left hand side, bottom left hand side come about. But there were all sorts of other things that he sent that were incredibly meaningful and related to also the pension in various different ways and his history, his institution, uh, tankas of various Buddhist, Buddha, Buddhas and other Buddhist deities um, that were really meaningful that must be, um, that we must uh, see as a whole picture to understand. This, this particular gift. There were also tankas of past. He also sent, basically everything he sent had a, a very distinct meaning. And we, we can know that through each various examples of, of, of things he sent on various occasions. The, when, the, when the Qianlong's mother da, passed away, so the Empress Dowager, the pension in fact sent a tanka set of the seven previous Buddhas. Um, very interesting with donor, with uh, figures of parents, with uh, figures mourning their parents. So, so everything is really uh, carefully calibrated and carefully managed is, is, the, is, the, is the sense here. Um, so, uh, so, so the, with this gift, the, the Qing court did as they did with a lot of other gifts, they produced various different adaptations of it. Um, and here you have tanka, you have albums, you have engravings and so on. Um, so um, formalized, um, and so I, I wanted to give just also a slight background to what this incarnation lineage tankas are and what they mean. So, um, Formalized tanka sets first became especially prominent in the courts of the Dalai Lamas and the Pension Lamas, um, whose incarnation lineage tanka series became well known, uh, not only through their public display in, central, in the central space of a monastery for veneration by the congregation of monks and pilgrims. Uh, if any of you have ever been to a Tibetan monastery of, of any denomination, you in the central, in the, the hall that you enter, that is the main, main hall, there usually a 
a kind of a, 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 a window, a gallery above, a kind of, a, 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 and, and around that is sort of clear kind of window, the gallery, the sort of gallery above, the, what is displayed is that, is the incarnation lineage of, of one of the main, of the, the chief um, Lama lineage that uh, resides in the monastery. Um, so not only is it kind of something that was actively and publicly displayed throughout, but also they were disseminated through mass production and circulation. So they were usually prescribed to be arranged horizontally around kind of a central image of a tanka, which usually features the latest incarnation. Um, and the genealogy, the sort of right order of things begins with uh, the most, so if you look at this, uh, I'll come back to the image above later, but if you look at this reconstruction here on below, you have the central figure of the current incarnation. So, and then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So the numbers have to do with the number of incarnation because within the India Indo Tibetan tradition, right hand is the privilege, right? The right side is the privileged side. So the first incarnation sits close, you know, sits closest to the central uh, current incarnation. And then the second, third, they display out radially. In this kind of order of hierarchy, hierarchical importance, uh, alternating between right and left of the central figure, um, and, and in this way, it's really nice because you, you're not only just looking at a lineage of people; you're looking at a kind of gathering of historical figures from different times as well, um, as you would in a gathering of assembly. So the photograph above shows the enthronement ceremony of the of the. Pension Lama that was chosen by the Chinese government. Uh, and this was the year, was the year 1995. Um, and even in that, I mean, we can sort of just shows the prominence of, of this, of this, the, this set of images. Um, and even in this photograph, which was, was, was a kind of official photograph with a lot of different Chinese officials and also monastic officials. Uh, and it was this book that was elaborately produced to kind of, uh, again, sort of really kind of display the, the formality that they took to, to choose um, the, the pension that they backed. Um, and so and in that photograph of this kind of most important occasion, um, of, uh, it was the, uh, hung above the, the, the tiny boy who was the chosen incarnation are these incarnation, uh, previous incarnations of the Pension Lama. And it includes also a photograph of the 10th Pension Lama who was hung, um, was out in the center. So, and so I think by that time already, and even earlier, you already started to have photographs replacing these. But again, the, the point is still the same in terms of kind of these various successive incarnations being displayed in this kind of pride of place in, in any given ceremony or ceremonial occasion. Wen Xing, may I just ask a question about those, the, about this photo you're showing? So um, those, the paintings that are hanging over mm -hmm. the child around the room are those photographs of paintings or paintings do you no, know those are, yes i think those are actually neither uh oh. i believe and i don't have i have to have a better picture of i have to just have an original photograph i believe those are in a totally different chapter i can't i don't have time to talk about it here but in the republican era uh a textile factory, and this is something Professor Patricia Berger has written about, uh, so you, I can refer you to that, that article. Uh, during the Republican area, the ninth pension lama, on uh, his visit to various parts of China, uh, in, in Hangzhou of all places, a very a startup textile factory uh, called Du Jingshen Factory, uh, as a present to the Pension Lama commissioned textile Hangzhou style embroideries of this set mm. based on the Nartan prints. And I believe that's what you're seeing here. I see, um, I see. Are these early 20th century textile um, uh, replicas. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, but I can't be sure because I, the polygraph is not so clear. So, um, So, so I think the so trying to understand this, we see how you have a, a, a display here that is a kind of horizontal panorama vis-a-vis -vis the central figure, and it pictorializes both a kind of 
diachronic lineage that moves through you know lineage that moves through time and a kind of synchronic assembly this idea that all of these previous members are now gathered here to make up for what comes together as the as the pendulum lama in some sense um, so um, um, because the rebirth lineage paintings were um, they were an early stage codified into wood, woodblock engravings for the purpose of proliferation and also standardization. Um, the team choice to both copy and prescribe models and to also improvise them really stand out. So on the left here is a woodblock print from the Nartang Monastery that standardized this incarnation lineage paint portraits of how they're to be depicted. So um, the process is like this. You have wood blocks and then the wood blocks are actually in, sort of printed onto uh, tanka surfaces. And then, so they act as kind of templates for painting. So you, they will be filled in with color. So we have now, if you go into Himalayan art dad, Org. Uh, I don't know if you use it, if if your students use this in in your classes. Uh, a kind of really rich repository of Himalayan art from all over in different museum and gallery uh, collections all over the world. Uh, and if you search for this series of pensions uh, lamas portraits or rebirth lineage paintings, they will come up. There are all sorts of iterations will come up. And even though the colorations differ, a lot of them are based on the same woodblock print template of the Nartang prints. Um, and so I think in that context, because you know you see so many of them, they're all pretty much very faithfully copying this or, or, or filled, uh, using this template. The Qing choice to do something different at the same time, um, still following this prescribed model is, is kind of something that, you know, it's kind of a, any like art history nerd would be very interested in. Um, so, um, but, it's more than that, of course, because you can see a lot from, from that process is, is why, why we're, we're looking at it. So if we compare the two versions side by side, um, we have the version on the left-hand side, that is the 1770 gift from the six pension, uh, you know, of course, one of the 12 tankas. And then the one on the right is the um, 1780 Qing imperial court copy or you know, in reinterpretation or adaptation, however you, we would like to think about it, of it. Um, we can see how uh, th the differences between them becomes very clear. Um, what was in the Tanka from Tibet as a kind of, it's almost like a kind of suggestive space um, is now, becomes now much better defined with receding lattice uh, works in the buildings and landscape uh, figures, and, and not just a central figure, figure, but all of the central figure and the subsidiary uh, figures are made uh, smaller to accommodate the elaboration of landscape and architectural elements, but also to convey the sense that they're kind of spatially plausible inhabitants of the environment. So here you can see um, Pavi Veka's spiritual teacher here, the famous, the philosopher Nagarjuna, which is seen above them here with uh, these Nagas, because his name is Nagarjuna. So they have these Nagas or um, snakes coming out of, of his head. Uh, uh, well, he here in this, in this iteration in the Nartown print kind of hovers above uh, on a lotus blossom in the upper left-hand corner, um, up opposite the sort of uh, de the, this deity of Chakra Sambara who um, is hovering on, <laughs> on the right-hand side. Um, when moving to this uh, uh, Qing Tanka now sits comfortably in what has become a kind of rooftop terrace. Uh, the same is true with the heretic right here and right here, um, who is now in this garden space. He, he has gets his own kind of garden space that is fenced off from the enclosed garden studio of Paviveka. Um, and- oh, Sorry, Wenxing, when there's a yes. hand up from Michelle. Okay. Yes. 
How would you spell um, Nagarjuna? Okay. Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna? Yeah, here, I, I can type it here in the chat, too. Could you type the other names as well, please? <laughs> yeah, Nagarjuna. Um, what were the other names? That Sorry. Um, so, so his name, and I didn't put uh, the Sanskrit diacritics, the critics, I apologize. Paviveka, Pa is actually long A, so you can see here. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, Chakrasambara is the other name. I so apologize. Okay. <laughs> no okay. problem. Sambara. There. Thank you. There, there's more to come. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'll keep up. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Richardson. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so here we have uh, so the, the you got you've got Nagarjuna, you have Chakrasambara, and then we have this heretic whose name I won't include. He's just a heretic, right? In this, in the, for purpose of this story, um, and uh, he's now sort of. Uh, he's now in a garden fenced off from the from this garden studio of Paviveka. Um, but you can see how here he's neither there or here because the point is not to to know where he is. It's to kind of create this kind of whimsical visionary uh, landscape where it's chaotic with a lot of diagonal lines. I'm talking about one on the left hand side, a lot of movement, things happening. It doesn't really matter where he is. It, the importance is this kind of debate that's happening between uh, Paviveka and the heritage. Uh, but here it's like, okay, that we, we've sort of expanded, elaborated to kind of actually make them convincingly reside in space. Uh, same with this kind of this on the upper, on the lower right hand corner, the four armed guardian deity of Mahakala. Thank you for spelling that out. Uh, uh, who had moved from the very bottom of the composition up to make room for the continuation of this garden enclosure. So this focus on really creating and finishing off the landscape with this kind of um, uh, 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 landscape and convincing sense of space. So while the sort of perspectival suggestions here. They don't necessarily, they don't make the paintings sort of illusionistic in the sense we think of uh, illusionistic paintings or trompe paintings, right? They're not tricking you into or convincing the viewer that this is um, some sort of plausible extension of the space that you are in. Uh, it doesn't, it's, that's not really the point of this perspectival system that it, it often is used to to induce that that experience. It, it that what it does do is invite our gaze to enter and to linger in this alternative space, um, whereas everything else in the Nartang uh, painting on the Nartang print based composition uh, stays very close to the surface. Um, so. I think, well, it's easy to see this transformation. Uh, we need to also remember that these two images partake in a very long, much longer process of exchange back and forth between the Qing court and Tibet. Um, the original, what we are calling, we're seeing the original with the Qing already was uh, copying from, on the left is already in some, in many ways, very heavily influenced by Chinese painting elements. You can see this blue and green rock outcropping, uh, even this kind of uh, elements of peony flower and scholar's rock, that those were things that are very clearly taken from Chinese um, um, motifs and also styles found in paintings, and that, that became very popular in areas of Tibet. Uh, but if we limit ourselves for a moment to this particular segment of the exchange, we see what is essentially a Qing courtly reimagination of the Tibetan imagination of Buddhist India with dual influences, dual influences from um, early modern European conventions of continuous perspectival space that was very fashionable at the Qing court at the time, and also elements of, as we talked about, refinement from the Chinese scholarly tradition. So by portraying the scholarly erudition and spiritual prowess of an Indian master using these new idioms and elements, the painting and presumably rest of the set uh, make the Indo-Tibetan genealogy uh, comfortably Qing and therefore recentering this illustrious Indo-Tibetan Buddhist genealogy in the Sino-Tibetan realm. 
I, I just have some details here that are kind of interesting. So this, you can see that the real transformation here, the, the screen here on the left already has some gestures or some sort of uh, ideas about kind of making this monochrome landscape with cloud imageries. But on the right, it really becomes, uh, you know, a, the, the painted screen, the so-called painted screen that is very evocative of what Chinese scholar gentlemen have sit in front of and is being portrayed with. You have also some of these other details that you know allows you to see the full development, uh, this kind of interest in uh, landscape elements as well, um, and the kind of de really development of this kind of garden ar architecture. Um, so, um, So as I mentioned earlier, the Tanka set of the Pension Rebirth lineage was also adopted into other media that were displayed in various palaces or, or in, and or gifted back to the Pension. So they also offer some clue to this process of adaptation. Uh, the Qing album on the right, um, I show a smaller image of, uh, 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 it's one. It's the same leaf of uh, of an of a larger album. Um, it's much closer in composition to the tanka, the Qing tanka, than to the Nartang based tanka from Tibet. Uh, but again, offers new improvisations in the treatment of landscape and buildings, and so on. And I think what it suggests, and I just have a detail here of how different these landscape treatments are. Uh, I think what it suggests is a, a really a latitude for experimenting. experimenting experimentation and for reinterpretation that was given to the artists at the court, um, even as their primary audience, the Panchen Lama, was the very subject of depiction, um, which I find interesting. So they, they, they sort of were, were entitled to uh, create new things and add new elements while kind of uh, retaining the, the basic uh, uh, structure and identity of, of, the, of the, original, the, or the original that they're copying. Um, so this all comes back to uh, this question of then how did you know how did how was this received right so if all of these various adapt uh, ad adaptations were made to welcome the the pension lama uh, what was the pension's response to this treatment. Um, and here is the, a really interesting part of the story that has recently only come into better light. Um, about a month after he had arrived in the Imperial Summer Palace of Chengde, and this, this is before he then went on to Beijing, uh, he composed, and you know, there were at this point in, in, in the visit, uh, the Qianlong Emperor was also in the summer, you know, he was in his summer palace in Chengde. Um, it's, uh, the pension was there, they were having meetings, they were exchanging, giving teachings, uh, all sorts of feasts were being given. We have actually many, we can, we can actually replicate, somebody's involved in this project, exactly what was fed, <laughs> uh, these kind of, you know, all, all of these archival documents we have. So we know that a lot of things were exchanged. One particular thing that was interesting and relevant to, to what we're looking at is that about a month after he arrived in the in Chengde, he composed the, the Pension Lama composed a prayer as a gift for the emperor's 70th birthday. Uh, and this time not of his own, right? It's a prayer to uh, Qianlong. And, and this is that very physical text uh, that, that was given as the gift. So the prayer pays homage to Qianlong's 11 former lives as kings and eminent monks from Buddhist India, dynastic Tibet, the Mongol Empire, and the transnational Galupa institution, ending with uh, a supplication to the emperor's alone life. So if the appellation of Mandrugosha emperors or Bodhisattva emperors signal the Tibetan recognition of the emperor's status as worldly embodiments of the Bodhisattva, this gift of rebirth lineage enmeshes Chelon further into the dominant inner Asian Buddhist structure of power at the time, namely the reincarnation system. 
So now recognized with his own incarnation lineage, Tianlong was accorded with the status of a reincarnate master, capable of choosing their own rebirth for the benefit of all beings. Uh, so the, the embodiment of a chain of former beings not only becomes a path to spiritual and worldly rule, but a means of connecting with other important lines of reincarnation through this multi-generational relations and affiliations. Qianlong was in fact not the first Qing emperor to have received a rebirth lineage, but his was the one that became widely documented in contemporary Tibetan language sources. So this list, uh, this is the list that uh, the, the, uh, the Penchen Lama authored that was presented to Qianlong. Um, and it gives you a sense of the temporal and geographic, geographical span, as well as their connection to the pension's own rebirth lineage uh, in each generation. And so this is where the convergence happens, is he's giving, he's giving the emperor um, uh, the emperor's past lives uh, in a way that is intimately connected with his own lineage. Uh, it's therefore not surprising that Qianlong and his court took this gift of, uh, of the emperor's past lives by making uh, their own copy, <laughs> uh, um, imperial grade copy of the text. Uh, the, so here you can see this Qing copy, um, in this Qing copy of the same text, much fancier. Uh, the inner covers include niches made of gold metal engravings and pearl inlays, and the text itself, 11 leaves total, is written with gold ink and dark paper. So employing the style and sumptuousness of courtly productions of Buddhist scriptures, the making of this work formally materializes the prayer into an object of veneration. And what is more, the Qing court also made an album that looks very much like the album that was made uh, in the Qing court for the pensions rebirth lineage. Uh, I, I won't go into it, but there are some leaves from this uh, album that are um, discussed in the short essay, um, but you can just see the, the proximity, um, the formal proximity um, that I think gives away this desire to connect through multiple lifetimes. Um, so I think all of this retracing about a sequence of past lives begs a return to the six pensions own untimely death. Throughout the course of the preparation for his travel, the, the building of the palaces and the plotting of rituals, uh, gifts and itineraries, we can, you know, we can get a pretty good sense that through the archival documents um, that about the danger of that the danger of smallpox was on everyone's mind. So this tragedy was no doubt also a great diplomatic embarrassment. Um, so if a great deal of attention was made to prevent it from happening, once it did, a greater deal perhaps of effort went into redefining and refocusing away from the tragedy and towards the auspiciousness and inevitable karmic uh, fruition of their meeting in this lifetime, they may mean uh, Qianlong and the pension, and a few other figures, um, like including the Zhang, uh, Zhang Jia Rope Dorje, and emphasizing a sense of continuity and renewal of kindred relations in the lives to come. So in a sense, the pension's rebirth lineage paintings and the, painting, and the pension's own subsequent gifting uh, of Qianlong's rebirth lineage both present this larger, much larger sense of self, one that contains countless past and future lives, and, and they, in some sense, prepped a way of this narrative and played into it. So after the pension's death, multiple more sets of the rebirth lineage ink engravings were commissioned for various halls and shrines of the imperial palaces, as though to conjure up the idea that one can still be present, right, without persisting in the same physical body. This is both uh, a, a narrative that was actively enacted and that one that was made possible through a shared, uh, what I mentioned from the beginning, kind of shared temporality. Uh, what I would like to call, for lack of a better term, help me think of a better term if you have, uh, for this temporality, what I'm uh, sort of trying to describe is this kind of reincarnation time, right? So it's both boundless, right? You can have, you know, within this kind of world, you have endless previous rebirth and endless uh, future ones to come. But it's also immediate, right? So there's it's here and now, um, and um, very uh, it's it's tangible, yet it's expendable and elastic. It's also both sequential and simultaneous. 
this shared sense of time undermines neither the religious nor the political implications of the relationship between Qianlong and the pension. What these objects in exchange tell us uh, is, is, I think, how they how invested both parties are in understanding and reinforcing connections beyond one lifespan. And that becomes the basis of their alliance more so than could any immediate political or religious benefits. Thank you. So I'll stop here. Um, and Yay! We can keep discussing. <laughs> what I don't know what time we have or what. Uh, how yeah. We're time. Oh, we're okay. I mean, it's two okay. twenty-three, but that was so okay. fascinating. I just, what is time? I'm so, I'm so into it. <laughs> uh, it's expandable, sequential, and simultaneous. <laughs> after all, so. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Both tangible and intangible. Um, or, <laughs> so that was amazing. Um, students, please. Uh, you, there must be some questions in the group, big or small, please let's um, take advantage of this moment with our resident expert on this fascinating topic to ask some questions. So maybe we should, I mean, you're, you were ending on this wonderful discussion, Wenxing, of, um, the, of like what is or you, your proposed term reincarnation time, like a different conception of time, which goes back to also this question of are these paintings about politics or about religion or can we even, what, why are we so obsessed with separating those terms? Because maybe that's completely our <laughs> contemporary baggage rather than theirs. So um, what do you think of that? Like, I, I mean, I like, I guess, reincarnation time. I don't have a better, I, I can't think of a better term right away. But, um, but I liked your explanation of like this connection and emphasizing and rearticulating, but also constantly mediating and changing. The, and like mm -hmm. expanding the mm -hmm. the reincarnation mm -hmm. logic mm -hmm. through these nuances, like the, mm -hmm. the importance of replicating mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and additions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what's what do you mm -hmm. think of this, students? This is also sort of what Shannon was starting to gesture at in the midst yeah. of your right. of your talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. I, I see a question from Michelle. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to. So, Sarah, I'm trying to think what uh, what was your what, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. What, what was yeah, your, yeah. your word? Let me see if I maybe I can bring it all in. And uh, <laughs> what, what you were you were asking me to elaborate on something? I, I'm sorry. Can you say yeah, that? and Shannon. Yeah, well, Shannon was uh, talking about this. Uh, so Shannon brought this up um, earlier in your talk too that. It's so interesting. I mean, you were you were, you gave us this really rich and specific example of this painted reincarnation lineage that goes mm -hmm. back and forth and and gets added to and copied and edited a bit, right? Mm -hmm. They look at first the same, but they're not exact copies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're also then emphasizing the importance of of like creating these gift sets of mm -hmm. like showing and stating arguments about these like relationships that span mm -hmm. across lifetimes, right? Across these many reincarnations. Um, and Shannon's question earlier was, or, or no, it wasn't so much a question, but she was saying, it's so interesting that Buddhism focuses at once on letting go of the self, yet these personalized portraits are so widespread. Mm -hmm. Like there's also such an important tradition and such a focus on like yeah creating this and naming these mm -hmm. sets of mm -hmm. individuals in direct reincarnation mm -hmm. um yeah. I, yeah yeah maybe one way to respond to shannon's earlier question that now that i think about it it takes me a little while you know i don't know about you but sometimes people ask questions and like three days later i'll think of the perfect answer but one of the ways that i think we can get at this is of course the liberation is the ultimate 
goal. But well, how to get there is the question, and the path is the method is the question. In some ways, by visualizing this multiple lifetimes, you are a little less attached to this lifetime. And so this is the goes plays back into how this was successfully played as a, you know, when this diplomatic embarrassment happened, where so tragically the pension who finally agreed to visit Qing court suffers and dies. Right? It's so sad, and it was. I mean, the emperor, everybody was grief struck, and so it was grief. Uh, uh, so, so, but how grief stricken? So, how do we? How do we? let go of that uh, while we are, you know, we just, while we, you know, everyone, they, they had obviously really good reports. So they were in some ways in the Buddhist sense, very attached to one another, like attached this lifetime. But if you think about it in the greater scale of things, such as this incarnation lineage, then maybe you can let go a little bit of your sense of self, whether it's yourself feeling sad or whether it's, the self that is being lost in its physical uh, life. Um, and so in some ways, you can think of this tracing of lineage as a way to re, as a way to help. It, it, it may not be, you know, if you talk to a Buddhist Lama, some might say it's true, some might say it's simply expedience. It's simply a useful way to understand how wonderful someone is, you know, because of these tracing of previous lives, you know, it's like basically every life is like a talent you have, right? If you're really good at debate, you have a previous life as a debate master. If you're really good at tantric meditation, you'll find a previous life as a great tantric meditator. If you're a great translator, you have have that too. So in some ways, these previous lives can be seen as a kind of portfolio, as a kind of your CV of what you're good at, as represented through these conceptions of previous lives. Some people, you know, a, lot, a Buddhist teacher may tell you, and I'm no of no authority whatsoever in any regard, that this is kind of the expedient ways to kind of show who these people, how we want to venerate these figures. It's not really that we want to believe that they were really, you know, reborn this in this way or not that in that way, but it helps you to think about and demystify your notion of what an individual is. And that is in some ways precisely what what Shannon is trying to what, what Shannon what Buddhist teachings according to Shannon is doing is letting go of attachment. So so in some ways this is a this is a method, right? By kind of showing you how how it's just the, the grand the grand scheme of things rather than the attachment to this life. Um, and so so that that's one way I, I think we can get at it. Uh, and that way is very typical, I would say, of Tibetan Buddhism in general, of being highly specific and being highly uh, articulate, uh, both in the tradition of meditative visualization, right? In order to arrive at emptiness or letting go of self or letting go of grasp of this conventional reality, we visualize in this kind of painstaking way, uh, even better reality that is just as detailed as the one that we're experiencing, right? So that's a, and that is how you Get, uh, that's how you break through to recognize that everything you believe in, that everything you see and touch and feel and smell are just so ephemeral and non-existent. Yeah. And so I think yeah. this is yet another way. Um, in this context of diplomacy, uh, you know, I could also see how um, the, it's it's helpful to get attached to these kind of many lives in the hopes of future ones. And this is how I, I'm hoping to answer Michelle's question about next incarnation. Uh, okay, so this is, I think something, even though time is as unstructured as it is, I think there's a huge difference between, on the one hand, the identification of the next incarnation, and on the other hand, the identification of the previous incarnations. Uh, and there's some, and the, the mechanics of them works differently, and the implications of them works differently. When you identify a previous incarnation, you don't have to go and find the guy. <laughs> Um, you're you're done by being the authority and you can recognize and they don't even have to be if you look at the pension lama the dates aren't that great like one incarnation previous to another is slightly later in historical time so it, you there's a lot of creativity and latitude uh, as long as you have the authority which the pension did uh, and you don't and, and and in terms of reincarnation instead of finding the reincarnation that's a whole different topic that uh, I, did, I could not address here, but that is relevant. Uh, and that for primarily is the engine for institutional succession, uh, which 
I think the pre-incarnations, yes or no, it's related because it's lineage and legitimacy, but this kind of finding the right next person is how the institution is going to continue. So it's a lot of that social institutional structure is hinged on that process, not in the same way that what I'm talking about here is uh, that the, the, that process might be, you know, you could have multiple people identifying different pre-incarnations. Uh, in fact, that's what happens in the 18th century. And then you have people who each time their reincarnations are identified, there are more, many more that are added. Uh, it's a poetic literary exercise as much as it was a kind of religious or political act. So, um, so there's, I think, and that's what interests me because it's like, you know, it, 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 it's, there's a lot of leeway. And, and the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, is that not only can you have multiple, you know, uh, reincarnations or add, you know, you can have as many as you want, this, the same historical figure could also be appear in as many people's incarnation lineage as as you want. So if you can, so that's what is also quite interesting. Two historical figures could trace back to the same previous incarnation, no problem. There's no, people don't have any issue with this because again, why not, right? So yeah. it's kind of, it's much more permeable. Yeah. I was wondering, so, Wenxing too, that that reincarnation lineage that they, that um, he creates for the Qianlong Emperor, is that a, like, is that a string of mm -hmm. anything that has existed before that he's adding Qianlong to, or is this a new, right. um, yeah. Is that, an, is that a new cis, is it a new line of people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, a lot of people, uh, that, there was a lot of, po there's a lot of, uh, what, like poaching? I don't know. There's, in the right. tradition, there is a lot of taking the whole lineage and add, adding uh, Qianlong's. I don't think it's anybody's. In fact, it would have been hard to imagine. I mean, I think this question sort of plagued me in my other research of like how Qianlong would really take this. Yeah, he is not only... Uh, you know, a kind of a, of a serious practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism who also used it to um, sort of um, to, to make his case for his, uh, 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 his control of Inner Asia. But he was also, you know, so, so, so um, it, it, this, he was also performing in the role of a Manchu uh, uh, Kang, right? He was also performing in the role of the Confucian son of heaven. And so it's the, all of these roles are simultaneous. And even if they don't conflict in his mind, they might in his court. So, yeah. you know, it's not very, yeah. it's not, it's kind of dangerous to like, say you want to all of a sudden promote yourself as a reincarnation of an Indian master for obvious reasons uh, that could be offensive to many people as his court. So yeah, yeah. I think your, what was your question? Um, uh, oh, if, yeah, his, so, if that line of reincarnations, right, exactly, right. that it inclu included so, Kublai Khan, but then goes right, back to Indian right. sources, is that a new line? So is that a new, new imagined? It's a, it's a new yeah. line, except, uh, so it's a new line, but figures in it had already been, so like Kublai Khan is a good example. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. before the pension, he had to write that one in. It was already mm -hmm. probably uh, commonly understood that he has this kind of, he's the Kublai Khan reincarnate, maybe just the kind of way that they say it. You know, even now we say, I'm the so-and-so, you know, what is yeah. it, so-and-so reborn in this kind of casual way. I think in the Qing court, mm -hmm. there may be talks like this. So when the pension wrote it, he had to write that in. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are figures he probably had to write in, but then, the lineage itself there's no precedent no it's no precedent and there but we can look at the lineage itself and um and yeah. look at and, and sort of make some sense of of what it is um you know that it's doing um yeah and so then you can you know you have an indian king who was the king percentage who was a, you know time he was a king at the time of the, the Buddha Shakyamuni, right? So he was mm -hmm. like playing this kind of patron benefactor role in some way, right. someone who endorses Buddhism. Right, um, the original yeah. king sidekick. Right, right. Or, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good right. point. Yeah. And then you have another <laughs> Indian king. So, so you can see how the choice here is um, uh, of like, like royal figures, but then there are also people like Samayavadra, kind of tantric siddha. And then you have uh, uh, Lotsawa, which is a translator. Uh, and then you have uh, a kind of, this is a kind of Siddha, Mahasiddha type figure or like, you know, sort of Drupchen, right? And then, yeah. and then these la last ones are really interesting. Tri the tri there are two tri chens here. They, they, they are both Gundan tri chens. They're both the abbots of the Gundan monastery. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
quite interesting. And this is problematic too. Like, how since when did your was your emperor was the Qing emperor a, a incarn and and reincarnation reincarnated. of a, yeah. a reincarnated from a Tibetan a Gundan Gundan monastery abbot, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, but I think the choices here again kind of. Oh, you know, it creates some connections to um, to pension and also kind of uh, round off Qianlong as someone who's both royally and uh, uh, in terms of his Buddhist achievements, practice, religious yeah. achievements, someone who's endowed scholarly and also meditatively and so yeah. on. So I think that's that's mostly what, what it's doing here. Yeah. It's a pretty neat lineage in terms of uh, For know, Western sure. chronology. So. It's wild. Yeah, it's cool. And then the uh, we should probably let you go soonish, mm -hmm. but I have one uh, other question that kind of connects to Sam's question in the chat. So right. Um, right. Samuel asked a question. He said, the replicated architectural works, mm -hmm. how did the builders determine what mm -hmm. was true to form? Mm -hmm. And do you think they took creative liberties? And also mm -hmm. I'll tell you, Wenxing, that Sam is an architect, I think, right? So Great. he's, he's going to be particularly <laughs> interested in that Chengde replica. Right. And right. Absolutely. I mean, I wrote in my notes, exact copy as rhetoric. Right. Really, right. like well, things are claimed, and this happens right. quite a lot, by the way, in the Tibetan right. Buddhist world, where you're told this yeah. is an exact copy. And then when you get to looking at it, you're like, um, it's completely different, but okay. But, but it's still but, understood or operated as right. a replica. Right. It's operating right. as a replica. Right. But, but yeah, I mean, right. huge creative liberties were taken, right? Or like, I mean, yeah. would we call them creative liberties? I mean, it's really... I think, again, I think if we adhere to form, Right, it's uh, we call them creative liberties, but we're talking about copying maybe efficacy, copying something else, and uh, uh, it was very interesting. But at the same time, they did care about form. It's not like they're just saying it's a copy. Uh, I think the really quick answer to Sam's question is that they took uh, architectural the paintings of famous monasteries as their basis for what they're going to build. And, and, and so they would have these faux Tibetan fortress windows built all over, I'll show you a picture. Uh, at the same time, as you enter these spaces, I mean, you, you can see they've never been to a Tibetan monastery. It's basically a, a, a regular Chinese hall wrapped around by this kind of fortress-like uh, architecture that are, not you know in the original fortress architecture, those windows are tiny because they're for it's a fortress. In the um, in the replicas, they're just fake. They're just fake windows. They don't have any, they're not windows. There's like a wall with these kind of decorative windows. Uh, so definitely uh, like kind of windows painted on or something. Are uh, they like kind of windows like picture. stuck on? Yeah. yeah. They're like I've always wanted to go to Chengde, but I've never been. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, so here you can I just maybe so you see these. Yeah. These little window. I don't think they're not windows. They're just uh, decorative, um, uh -huh. and then it's basically a, just a big wall. And you see, and they're hiding this building here inside, which is the central hall, uh, uh -huh. with a wraparound hall because they don't quite know what to do with the 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 outer. La uh, sort of a uh, um, difference between a Tibetan style architecture and the sort of Chinese one, which is what they know how to build. So they right. wrap this fake facade, what I call fake, you don't have to call it fake. We don't, in fact, fake is in no windows, right? Pretending to be windows. So yeah. Faux, yeah. faux, faux fortress architecture, uh, wrap it in, uh, wrapping it around a building that once you enter inside is no different from any other Chinese uh, building. And, and one tell, and, and so, yeah, so and even in fact, in the, I don't want to go on to, never mind, I won't go into too much tangent, but, but basically, <laughs> uh, I think the main things that they have are, are uh, paintings, rep painted representations of monasteries to convey a sense. Um, and, um, but there are also other places, buildings that are replicas where they have central icons that are being uh, replicated reproduced as, yeah uh, right, reproduced and yeah. Um, and also maybe the circumambulatory route that for example the right. jokan they represent they the lhasa jo the, the jowo hakan the lhasa jokan was um replicated in beijing for the pension lama interestingly and you can mm. see the circumambulation route that they try to replicate, mm. replicate. Mm. kind of interesting and does so. and does that jowo image exist is that 
No, it's, it's no. all in ruins. Yeah. I think the whole thing okay. was probably, I can't remember how it found ruins. Yeah. It's probably the Alliance. Ally. Yeah, but anyway, so they we don't yeah. have anything like that, but we have, yeah. the, you can go to the ruined sites now if you visit Beijing, it's very close, to, it's very yeah. easy to get to, and you could see the way that the columns are laid out, that it's really a, a kind of circumambulatory Intentional route. circumambulatory yeah. route, interesting. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's, we, I mean, of course, we were talking about Shalu a few weeks ago, so this is like, yes. it's like, a, yeah. this is sort of the reverse case of like a Tibetan building made that's then renovated into looking right. Chinese but then has that again like kind of disjuncture of architectural right. styles yes, and here we have a Chinese right. building trying to look like a Tibetan building but from via you know with tra right. the translation happening right. via painting so right. really interesting. And I, wonder, I wonder if Shalu was ever because you know the Tibetan court Right, the Qing court replicated so many monasteries in Tibet. I wonder if they had ever, just like the case of the Tankas, ever replicated something that was intentionally trying to copy Chinese buildings, yeah. Uh, yeah. like Shalu. Um, it would be interesting yeah. to kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, guys, are there any other questions for Wenxing before we let her go? I, we, I think we kept you a really long time, but it was so interesting. So I loved it. I loved question. a deep dive into the into that painting. Yes. What's, sure. So yeah. Anandita oh, yeah. asked the oh, yeah. importance of silk in gifts. Uh, yeah. So uh, silk was primarily produced in China. So it was considered really luxurious, precious gifts when they go send them. Uh, they were the sort of uh, rolls of silk were considered uh, very prized uh, gifts to be sent to Tibet. Um, and because the t t Tibetans like the pension received so much of it that they started using them to mount their tankas and, you know, plaster it with their walls. And so, yeah, so definitely a kind of very precious um, gift and commodity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there something? Yeah. What does your class end? Uh, what time? Well, it ends at three, but but okay, we have, have a couple of other things to do right. okay. before. So, so we can also, yeah. You can also, yeah. So we there's... can also, yeah. I I actually the silk question was bringing up something else mm -hmm. for me, but. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, the, I, but I'll ask you another time. The Kedrup J mm -hmm. painting, though, I was really interested in that mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. showed briefly. Mm -hmm. But Kedrup J is not in the Panchen Lama lineage. He is. He is. He is. Oh, he's, he's one the of the Panchen Lamas. He's the first okay, right. Yeah. Okay. Song Kampas retroactively so, recognized. Yeah. Okay. So the relate real relationship. Kevin's asking, what is what do you mean by the real relationship? Can, can you hear us, Kevin? Sorry, I am a, uh, okay. Kevin. So he texted just to me asking what the, what is the real relationship between Mongolia, Tibet and the Qing. I feel like in their, the reading, their relationship is great, but I have a feeling that it's just the surface. So maybe we can carry on later. I'm not sure what you, I'm sure I understand the question directly, but um, that's a big question too. So right, I feel like we right. we, yeah, we we'll, can... tr we'll try Kevin to answer okay. in the remainder of the Sounds whole good. course too. Okay. <laughs> the impossible <laughs> question of the, I mean the, I mean if anything though, of course the relationships are ever changing and negotiated, right? That's Between, right? right? Like that's yeah, right. but it depends on the the moment <laughs> that we're referring legal, to. Legal relationships or you know what, yeah what, what, yeah so yeah anyway yeah okay so yeah. we won't get there. <laughs> Great, we won't go so, quite. Okay. But cool. Yeah. Thank you. So Wenxing, let's thank give you. let's give Wenxing a big thank you. That was really wonderful. Um, thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you so much for being here with us today and for sharing your work and research with us. It was fascinating. And uh, I hope you can stay cool in New York City today. I'll try. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Thank you so much. Bye.